In .NET, iterators provide a way to create an enumerable. While you can implement the iEnumerable interface, iterators makes it much more easier with the yield statement. In this video, let's learn more about the yield statement to create an enumerable, how to use it, how it works, and also about the lazy evaluation when using yield statement. We will also see a real world use case to search through a large log file stored in a cloud storage without having to download the entire file into memory in your application. Hello everyone, my name is Rahul and welcome back to this YouTube channel. If you're new here, I make videos on .NET, Cloud and DevOps. This video is sponsored by AWS and is part of my C-Sharp series. Without much delay, Let's get into learning more about iterators and the yield statement. Iterator methods are methods that creates a source for an enumeration. This basically uses the yield return and also the yield break statements. Let's see a quick example on how to create an iterator method using these two. For this video, I will be using Linkpad, which is a scratch pad for .NET for writing quick code. I won't be using any of the standard IDEs. However, you can try this code in the IDE if that's what you prefer. So in Linkpad, I have an async task main. So let's first create our new iterator method. So I'll keep this as static and I'll make this as an I enumerable of integers. And let's simply say create simple iterator. Now here we can use the yield statement to return the values. So let's simply say we are going to return numbers from 10, 20, 30, etc. So I can use multiple yield statements to return these multiple numbers that I need inside the enumerable. So you can see I'm simply creating an enumerable by using the yield statement. To consume this iterator method, let's go into our main statement and let's create the numbers and let's call this method, which is the create simple iterator. Now this is going to create this method, return back an enumerable, which you can loop through using for each statements. So you can say number and in the sequence numbers. For each of these number, let's simply print this to the console. I'll use a dump, which is a method link pad supports to simply dump this value into the console. Now, if I run this application, this is going to print the results 10, 20, 30 inside our console. This is very similar to us creating a new list of integers and passing in with the value 10, 20, and 30. However, we have created a custom I enumerable without using any of the standard enumerable classes that you would be using like list, etc. Now behind the scenes, the c -sharp compiler automatically creates a state machine and generates an enumerable type for us. Now to see that in Linkpad, there is a way to open the query and say reflect this query in ILSpy. You can also do this for a normal DLL if you're using a standard IDE. Now in the ILSpy, you can see the compiled code in here. Now you can switch between the different c -sharp versions to see the different code that it generates. Let's switch this over from c -sharp 11 to C Sharp 1 so that we can see what the compiler does to implement some of these modern C Sharp features. So here you can see that it's creating a new class which is main of t underscore 4 which is a random class that the compiler has generated. So if I go into that class right in here you can see that again is creating a state machine and this state machine is again internally going to use the create simple iterator underscore 5 which is again a compiler generated class. This is the class that implements the i enumerator of int and also i enumerator of int and the non generic interfaces. So the compiler has automatically created a method which implements these interface for us and return that inside that function. Now this acts like a state machine and keeps track of the method and returns the numbers one by one. Now if you want to learn more about this in detail about the state machine, let me know in the video and I can do a different video for that. So let's come back to our link pad and explore the features of yield statements. So let's say I want to take in a number and return the multiples of tens in loops till that number. So I can replace this code instead of hard coding. Let's start a for loop. So let's specify in i is equal to zero, i less than the number that we have passed in, and let's increment i by one every time. Now in this case, let's create a temporary variable. So let's specify var tens is equal to just the i number multiplied by 10. So we're simply going to return multiples of 10. Now, 
Once we have that, let's say yield return tens. Now, if I was to run this method again, so let's simply pass a number five and run it, and you can see this returns 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, just as what we expected. Now, if I put in a different number, so let's say 15, in this case, it's going to return all the way till 140. Now, let's say we want to limit this enumerable so that the maximum value it returns is 100. So in this case, we can add an if condition here. So if tens is greater than 100, we can simply exit this loop. For that, we can use the yield break statement. So you can use yield and specify break. So this means we have reached the end of the enumerable and to break it out of the loop. So now if I run this again, you can see this now returns only till 0 to 100, even though I specified the number 15. Now, if I enter a number less than that, which is 5, it is going to return only till 40. Now that we understand the basics of the yield statement, let's see how these methods are getting evaluated. So let's add some console statements before and after inside our for each loop to see how this is getting evaluated. So before we start, let's say starting the loop and let's dump that message onto the console. Let's also dump a message before we return each of these values. So let's say returning for the variable i. So let's simply use that. So we can use string interpolation for that. And let's dump that again. Now at the end of the loop, let's say ending and dump that message as well. So we have three ports before starting the loop, during the loop, and also ending inside the loop. Now if I run this again, so let's press F5, you can see this is starting the loop first. It's returning for zero but it's immediately writing that value inside here, after which it returns for one, and then it dumps that value inside our for each loop outside the iterator method. So each of these values is getting generated as it is requested and looped through in our outer loop. So as and when we ask for the numbers, it's generating them in real time. This is because the iterator methods are lazily evaluated. So it's only generating the numbers exactly when it needs to. So if I put another command inside here, so let's say printing numbers and let's dump that. And if I put a breakpoint at the for each loop, let's run this. You can see that the printing numbers is already invoked, even though we have already invoked the create simple iterator method. Now this hasn't generated the enumerables yet. However, it's going to generate it only as we loop through the enumerable that we requested. So once we loop through and ask for the first number, it's going to now generate the number. So you can see starting the loop and returning for zero. Now, once we dump that, it's reading zero inside the console, and now it's looping to the next number and generating the next number in the sequence. So it's just looping through and getting the values as and when it's required and dumping that into the console. Now, in a simple method like this, you wouldn't find this much interesting. However, let's say we want an infinite sequence of numbers, which is of multiples of 10. In this case, if you were to pre-generate these numbers in your memory, you might run out of your memory space. However, if you're requesting it as and when you need it, you would not run into this problem. So let's see how that would work. So let's remove this int number limit and let's make this an infinite sequence of 10s. Now in this specific case, since there is no upper limit, we can replace the for loop with a while loop. So we can simply specify while true, which is going to be an infinite loop. Now we still need an integer i, so let's make that as an internal variable. So let's specify where i is equal to zero and let's start from zero. So the first 10, it's going to be zero and it's going to return each of these values. Now in this case, we don't have a limit, so let's remove this and it's going to be an infinite sequence. Now, since we don't have any limit on this method, we can simply call the create iterator now in the numbers, if I want to put a limit, I can specify take and specify 100 and let's run this again. Now you can see in the results that it has not yet generated the iterator numbers, but as we loop through the numbers, it's going to run and print these numbers. Now this has returned all zero, which is because I have an incremented i in the loop. So once we return the tens, let's simply put i++ and run this again. Now in this case, it's again hitting the breakpoint and it's running again. So you can see now it's returning for one 
and returning the value 10. Then it's going to the second loop and returning 20 and so on. Now, if I scroll down, you can see it returns all the value till 990. Now, if I was to change this number to 1000, I'm going to get back a thousand list of this. So you can see now this has generated all the way up to 9990. So now the create simple iterator method is an infinite sequence of multiples of tens. Now, if I don't specify any limit on this, this is going to keep on running this method in an infinite loop. Now, based on the different conditions on how you want to generate the number of tens multiples, you would be using this numbers enumerable. And since the iterator method is lazily evaluated, you don't run into the problem of running out of memory exceptions. Each of these number is generated just in time when it's required to be used. So let's comment this out and see a different example where we can use iterators. Now I have a very large log file which is about 187 MB in size in my local machine. Now I can open this in Visual Studio Code and search through this inside here. Now let's say the same file is also on your cloud storage. Now you could also be using a file on your local machine, but to make it more interesting, I have put it in a cloud storage. So I'm using AWS S3, which is a cloud object storage. Now, if you're completely new to S3, I highly recommend checking out the video linked here in the descriptions below. Now, this could be any other cloud storage which could be on Azure, Google Cloud, etc. So if I navigate into S3 and navigate into one of the buckets, which is how Amazon S3 stores files. So I have user services, large messages, and I have the same file in here, which is android.log. Now you can see the size of this is around 184 megabytes. So let's say I want to search through this file using my C -sharp code. Now I don't want to download the entire file because that is going to take some time and also consume the memory on my application server. So let's see how we can use yield statement to achieve this result. So let's switch back to LinkPad. Now I have the required libraries that's required to connect to Amazon S3 already added, which are the two SDKs, that's AWS SDK.S3 NuGet package, and also system.link.async to work with async enumerables, which we will see shortly. So let me copy and paste the basic method structure which is going to talk to an S3 object. Here I have a method fetch and process logs async which takes in an S3 client the log file key which in this case is going to be our file name and also the term that we want to search on. Now all this is doing is getting the S3 object by creating the get object request. That's how you interact with S3. So you can specify the bucket name and also the key of the file that you are interacting with. Now once we have the get object request we can make use of the S3 client and get the object. So let's specify using where S3 object, which we are going to retrieve. So let's use the S3 client in this case and say get object async and pass in the object request, which in this case is get object request. Now, once we have this object, let's use the stream that's on this object to read through the file. So let's add an await since this is an async method. Let's specify using where stream is the S3 object dot response stream. So let's use this response stream to search through this file. Now let's open up a reader so that we can read through this. So let's specify where reader, which is going to be a new stream reader. And let's pass in the stream that we just read, which is the response stream. Now we have the reader to read through this file. So let's keep a temporary variable, which is the line. So let's read line by line. So let's specify reader dot read line and use the async method, which is going to read the line. Now we can keep on continuing the loop as long as there is a value for the line. So let's wrap this into a line statement and let's specify that the line is not equal to null. So as long as the line is not null, we will keep on continuing to read the file. So in this case, if the line contains the search keyword, which is going to be our value. So we have the search term inside us. Now, if you want to ignore the case, let's specify ignore the case. So let's specify that so that this is a case insensitive search. Now, if that line contains the specific search term that we are interested in, 
let's specify that line. So to look back, we are getting the object from S3. We're just opening up the stream using a stream reader. We are reading line by line from this file, checking until the line is null, which means we've read till the end of the file. And we check if the line contains that term, then we're going to return that specific line. Now let's consume this inside our main method and see how this works. So let's specify where lines is fetch and process sync. So now in this case, we need to pass an S3 client so we can create an S3 client in here since we have the NuGet packages. This is going to have the Amazon S3 client instance and let's create a new instance and pass in the client. Now in this case, we have the file name which is going to be android.log and let's say our file search term is going to be service. So this file, which is I have opened in VS Code, does have the keyword service occurring multiple times. So let's specify service as our search term and let's call this method. Let's add the for each loop like before. So let's specify for each and let's specify line and let's specify the lines. Now in this case, you can notice that this is returning an i async enumerable of string instead of an i enumerable. This is because I am using an async await inside the method to get the file. So I have to read through the stream, read line by line, and each of these are an async await method, which is why I'm using an async enumerable. Now, if you're completely new to async enumerables, I highly recommend checking out my video, which will be linked here, and also in the descriptions below. Now to consume this, instead of simply using a for each, I'll have to use an await for each. Now on the lines, I can put a constraint. So let's specify take and let's specify take 100. So it's going to return the first 100 occurrences. Now, once we have the line, I can dump this into the console like before. So let's run this again. Now you can see it has logged out all the lines which has the word service. Now this ran very quickly even though the file we are searching through is very big. So this has definitely not downloaded the entire file into memory to search through this. What this has done is it's reading through the stream, it's reading each line by line and searching that and returning as required. Now if I want less number of records, so let's say if I need only 10, it's only going to return 10. Now, if we were to write the log statements inside here to see the execution, you can see that this is also getting lazily executed. Now, if I want more statements, so let's say if I want 200 of these lines and run that, it's going to return as many as it can find. Now, if there are no more lines with the server statement, then it's going to cap whatever limit it has in that file. I hope this helps you to understand about iterators in C Sharp, the yield statement, and how to use it in real world use cases. If you like this video, please make sure to hit the like button. If you want to be notified of future such videos, please hit that subscribe button. It also helps me to grow this YouTube channel. Thank you and see you soon in the next video.